Praise the Lord and welcome to the Greater Atlanta Healing Temple Sunday School Session. We thank you for joining us. We are conveniently located at 1332 Holcomb Avenue in East Point, Georgia, and we invite you to come and worship with us. Today, we will be speaking on the household of God. And before we begin, we will start with the word of prayer. Almighty and precious God, we thank you for bringing us together one more time, for keeping our hearts encouraged and giving us an appetite for your word. We ask that you open our understanding that we may rightly divide your word and hide in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, this is Pastor Smith of the Greater Atlanta Healing Temple, and our subject today is the household of God, the household of God. And in the lesson is found in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. The household of God. Our text for today reads as follows. Wherefore remember that you, being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hand, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments containing ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. We thank God for this wonderful lesson, and especially for those, the non-Jew, this should be consolation and confirmation that we, too, have a place in the kingdom of God, just as well as our Jewish brothers and sisters. Paul, and he began talking to his letter to the church at Ephesus, hence we call them Ephesians, he reminds them and reminds us today through his word to the Ephesians that at one time in our lives, before we came to Jesus, before we were saved, repented and were baptized and filled with God's spirit, we were not members of the household of God. Household referred to those individuals who are living as a family in a house or building. When 
the gospel first shot, it was to the Jews only, not to the Gentiles, those who are outside the Jewish family, but it was sent to the Jews only. Uh, we read that even in, I believe it's the beginning of the church when Peter was preaching and he was saying uh, the promise was unto the Jews and to their children. And then he said, even to those of us who were far off, as many as the Lord our God should call. Thank God, God called you and I, at Gentiles, out of the world so that we too can become part of the household of God, fellow brethren and sisters with our Jewish brothers and sisters. So Paul starts off in this letter today reminding us and this is why we have a special reason to celebrate Jesus, to appreciate Jesus, and to magnify his name because of the salvation work that he did bringing us into the household. We were outside the house, but he invited us into the house and not only made us guests, but he made us residents, part of the family of the household of God. And he said, now, before he did this, we were, at that time, we were called uncircumcision. The Jewish people, part of their ritual, their uh, relationship with God was for them to be circumcised. They uh, performed this ritual because they had a special commandment and it showed a special relationship as being part of the family of God that the rest of the world did not have. The Jews had this special privilege and place with God. So they were called the circumcision. We, the Gentiles, the sinners who were non-Jews, we were looked down upon by the Jewish people we were called uncircumcised, uh, with basically many filters. They looked at us as being unclean. And that is why when you read in the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish people did not uh, believe in going into areas populated by non-Jews because they felt that then they would be defiled or contaminated by people outside the household of God. So they looked on all the non-Jews as being underclassmen and themselves as being circumcised of the circumcision. They were like the upper class and that's the way they looked. So there was an enmity between Jew and Gentile. There was a separation. Hence, uh, we talk about uh, the veil of the temple being rent in twain. The, the, even in the Old Testament, when the people went to the temple to worship, the Jews uh, could go further inside in the inner court. Uh, the Gentiles, they, uh, there was a place in the temple that were reserved for non-Jews, and non-Jews could go no further than that particular boundary and the court of the Gentiles. But the Jews can passed through the curtain and gone further into the temple because they considered themselves the circumcision, those that were clean, those people who had a special relationship with God. But Paul is reminding us, and if we go through our lesson, we will find out that we have much to be grateful for because Jesus, with his dying on the cross, the price he paid for our freedom. He tore that wall that separated Jew and Gentile. He tore it down. And we no longer were Jew and Gentile in Christ, but we were his children, one body. And he said that at that time we were without Christ. We were just going on doing our thing. The Gentile uh, nations, they worship idol gods. Some of them sacrificed their children in the fire. These were not 
uh, rules and a tradition that God people kept. God had warned and spoke against getting involved in this type of activity. But the Gentile nations engaged in this type of activity and other things that were against God's word. Therefore, they looked at us as unclean, as defiled. So Paul reminded them that we, at that time, we were without Christ. We were alien from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. The promise was to the Jews first before it uh, was extended through Jesus to us Gentiles. That was salvation was for the Jews. So we were on the outside. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. And we were just simply cut off from the grace of God. And as such, we did not know the laws of God and we did not follow them. So we were without hope. Can you imagine living in a world and you don't have any hope at all? You're just going through uh, the paces every day. But before we came to Christ, before that mighty work that Jesus did to save, we were not in this world. We didn't even have any hope. We were without Christ. Christ, well, we weren't looking to Christ. We were not even on his side. And he said, and we were without God in the world. Even though many of these people worship some God, they worship the false God, the idol gods, gods who could not move, gods who could not hear them, gods who could not respond to them. That's who the Gentile nations worshiped. But Jesus changed that. He said, but now, in verse 13, but now in Christ, we're talking about the household of God. What is his house? like now what is his family like now today he said but now in christ jesus who you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of christ in other words we the gentiles that we were separated from the jews they went into the temple they worshiped god god dwelled with them god dealt with them god blessed them he kept them but we, the Gentile world, we were dead in our own ways and our trespasses and our sin. So we were without God. We did not worship the true God. We worshiped the sun, the moon, and all these other things. But Jesus came to make a change. He said, but now in Christ Jesus, we are made nigh. That means we are no longer a long way from God standing off. But now... He has brought us near him. We are so close, we can reach out and touch him. We can abide with him. And this is through the work of Jesus Christ. He said, for he is our peace, who has made both one. What both? Jew and Gentile. And so Jesus, by coming and doing, giving his life on the cro uh, cross, we, the Gentiles, Jesus came as a light for the Gentile world. All of those who were non-Jews, remember, salvation first was to the Jews. But what about all the rest of us who were not Jews? But Jesus came and he changed that because he was a light for us, the Gentiles, that showed us the way. Uh, it was prophesied in Isaiah 49. Verse 6, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentile. So Jesus, the Son of God, was given to us as a light. In Matthew 121, Jesus was called from the womb. He had a special job. And it's told Mary, said, for he shall save his people, which include you and I, as well as the Jew, from their sin. And Jesus, he had to go through all of this. They tried to take his life because God had a job for him that he saw you and I needed to be saved and brought into his household. So the acceptable year of the Lord, and when you talk about in Luke chapter 4, he talks about what his job was. He was anointed to preach to the poor. We were the poor in heart. 
We thought we were doing good. We thought we were worshiping God, but we were worshiping a false God. And his job was to preach deliverance to captives. Was that us? Yes. Why were we captive? We were captured by sin. We did everything that God said don't do. We did not know the true God. And he came to give sight to the blind and to set at liberty the bruised. That was you and I, the Gentile. Before we came to Christ, we were not even considered a people. We were looked on as dogs. All right. So we have here uh, Jesus. We were talking about uh, how Jesus was sent to the uh, Gentiles. And Peter, in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, we see where Peter gets his introduction to coming and bringing the message to the Gentile world. That's where it began. There was a man named Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion. He was not Jewish. He was a Roman centurion, which means he was in charge of one a group of 100 soldiers. But he heard the truth. God, he was praying. He was a man. Even though he was not saved, he Worship God. And God heard his prayer and sent Peter, who became a great the pillar of the church. He sent P uh, Peter, and Peter at the beginning was saying, you're talking about me going to a Gentile's house? Because the Jews know that that was a no-no. They could not fellowship with um, non-Jews. So, Jesus wanted to introduce more family members into the household of God. We already had the Jews, but now Jesus went to work a little bit further. And he said he made in himself of twain one new man. Here we had Jew and Gentile, two distinct groups of people. Both God's creation, but one was God's chosen people who followed God. But Jesus took those two groups and he made one. How? Through his blood, through his dying on the cross, through his ministry, through his work of salvation for mankind, not just the Jew, but for the Jew and Gentile, and he made out of two different nations, one. So Jew and Gentile now can worship together, serve the same God, and follow the same set of laws. And now the enmity, the bickering between the Jews and the Gentiles, because they didn't want to have anything to do with us. They looked on us as dogs, and we looked on them as being snobbish. But Jesus came, and through his work, through his grace, the two, Jew and Gentile, were brought together, and now we are one in Christ. We have the same Father, have the same Spirit, and now we have the same Father, and we live in the same house. That is the house of God. Amen. Because we have both been washed in his blood. So, it said that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Reconcile me, you got two different parties, two different sides at odds fighting one another. But reconciliation means that the two different sides are brought together in agreement. And then they have peace with each other. So now in Christ Jesus, Jew and Gentile are brothers in Christ. And that means we have been reconciled. All right. So now as we go on into the lesson, we find out it says have, that Jesus, by reconciling Jew and Gentile, he got rid of the enmity 
the bickering between the two groups because now they live in the same house that is the household of God. And he said he came and preached peace to us, the Gentiles, who were far away because we didn't know anything about salvation. We didn't know anything about the blood, uh, importance of Christ's blood. But Jesus brought the good news to us. And today we can worship and praise the same God, the living God, that the Jews did because we are one. And he said, and to, he preached the same message to them that were far off. That was the Gentile. And to them that are not, that was the Jews who were already there. And he said, for through him, through Jesus, Jew and Gentile, we both have access by one spirit, the same spirit, unto the Father. Look, he said, verse 19 Thank God, thank God for reconciliation. He said, now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So now we are in the house. We belong to God just as the Jews. We are God's chosen people. As long as we accept Jesus, obey his word, repent and baptize and start following his word, we too have access into the household of God. He said, now therefore we are no more strangers. We were strangers because we didn't know anything about going to the temple and worshiping God, uh, going and uh, having the offering of thanksgiving and all of these things. We didn't do that. But now we know the significance and we know who Jesus is and we know the importance of of the work that he did to bring us together. He said, now we have fellowship with the saints. That's a good word, fellowship with the saints. It doesn't matter whether they are Jewish, whether they are African, whether they're in America, whether they're in Japan, every saint that is following Jesus, obeying God's word and is a member of God's family, we have fellowship together no matter where we are because we have the same Father. And look, so now that we are in the same house together, the same house that Jesus built, look what verse 20 says. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Bethel. All of these, the apostles, Andrew, James, John. So they are the foundation of the plan to salvation. That's who God used to get his people into his household. Thank God he used these prophets and the apostles. Amen. And he said, now they built this godly house, the household of God. And to make sure that it is right, that it's holy, that it is pure, and that it is what God has ordained. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. He's the head of the corner. The job, the job of a cornerstone when a builder is building a building, they will lay a cornerstone on the one of the corners of the building, and that will use, be used to align all of the rest of the block, the brick, or the building materials up so that the building would be joined perfectly together, would not be one-sided, uh, the walls would not be crooked, but that they will fit together. And Jesus is the one. Amen. The cornerstone is that principal stone at the corner of a building's foundation uniting two walls. So we got the uh, prophets and the apostles, Old Testament and New Testament, being brought together and is bound together with G this cornerstone, which is Jesus. That cornerstone is set to align the other stone to assure that the walls are straight and the corners are at right angles. So, 
he says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone and all of the saints of God, Jew and Gentile, are building upon this foundation that has already been laid and God has ordained it this way. That's why he sent the prophets of old. That's why he sent, uh, calling to the disciples and the apostles and taught them so that they can teach you and I as we go through his word so that we will know how to become members of the household of God and remain in the house. So he said, Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone of this building. And all of these stones, all of these blocks are put together compactly. That means there are no uh, holes in them. There are no big spaces in them. They are joined just perfectly together. And when they are joined together and finished, you got one big, nice building with a strong cornerstone. Amen. So Jesus, we see in First Peter, the word says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Jesus, elect, precious, he that believes on him shall not be ashamed. And it said, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. A lot of people did not like Jesus. They did not believe in Jesus. They did not want him. That's why they said away with him. They wanted to see him dead and out of the way. But they didn't know. They were setting him up to become king of kings and lords of lords. And in doing so, he became the chief cornerstone and he is the basis of our salvation. The scripture said, no man can come to the Father except by Jesus. And that is why he is so important, most fundamental in our salvation. And that's why we praise him and we seek to serve him day by day. And it said, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. What we're talking about, he's not talking about a building that's made out of block, a stone, a brick. You and I, each one of us is a part of the building. We might be a brick, we might be a block, but you and I, everybody that gets saved, everybody that follows Jesus, whether it's you, a Gentile. Amen. Whether you are Gentile, we are part of the building. And it takes all, not just one stone to make a building, but all of these have, these have the bricks or the block, whatever material has to be laid on the foundation securely and built up one by one until you get the finished building. So you and I, some people uh, join a back got put in the building uh, by being filled with the Holy Ghost in 1967, some in 1970. It doesn't matter when you became a part of this building of the household of God. The important thing is to make sure that you become or have become part of the household of God. And it's in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. God's temple, God's house is holy. You and I as being part of the house, we must continue to be holy because we are part of God's family. We are part of the household. He said, in whom you also are built together for an inhabitation of God through the spirit. Amen. So how do you get uh, to become a stone? Of everything? When they're building a building, they just don't pick every brick or every stone they pick one that is fit that they know is going to work well and you today you can make sure that you are one of the stone that god is picking out that's choosing to be part of his household repent of your sins be baptized according to acts 2 and 38 of in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission or removing of our sins that we were born with. And he promised that
that he will fill us with the Holy Ghost. That is how we become part of the household of God. And then once we become part of the household of God, we continue walking and so that we can stay in the family, stay in God's house until Jesus comes. We want you to just I hope you are enjoying this lesson. We want you to say, ask yourself, am I part of God's household? And you can answer the question. You know whether you are not, if you are saved or if you are striving to be saved or not. Now we want you to join us again as we continue these wonderful lessons, even next week. Our lesson next week is entitled, A High Calling. A High Calling. And the lesson is found again in the book of Ephesians, this time in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Again, next Sunday's lesson is entitled, A High Calling. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. We trust that we are blessing to you. Pray for us. God bless you. And feel free to come and worship with us. Greater Atlanta Healing Temple Church. We are apostolic. We believe in the Apostles' Doctrine. We're located 1332 Holcomb Avenue, East Point, Georgia. Until next week, God bless you and keep you in his care. And we look to see you in the building. God bless you, Lord. Keep them. Cover them, supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.